Logan Williams, and uh, I was in one of the 109 uh, De Texas Department of Corrections that you guys wave to and say hello to every Sunday morning. John Melander came in. Um, I know him as Chaplain John. You know him as Pastor John, and uh, was bringing the services in. Very powerful worship. I fell in love with Jesus. A couple of years later, got out. I contacted John. He invited me to the church. I came to the church for a couple of months, and then I relapsed uh, on drugs. Got back into the old lifestyle, and then, uh, but but God kept pursuing me. And in the at the depths of it, as worst as it could get, there was that still small voice from Christ that that was like, "Hey, man, you can get up and and leave this room if you want to, but don't do it if you don't want to." But it was such a gentle voice. I d I knew it was Him beyond the shadow of a doubt, and I, and I got up and left, not even really knowing where I could go. And I found my way into uh, a sober living house. You know, God opened the door. The, then the next door was the retreat coming up. You know, it was in a couple of months, so I signed up for that. Met a guy on that retreat that, that gave me a job. I've now served on two more additional retreats. I'm a leader in the, in the, in the men's ministry groups. I'm, I think this is my third semester, uh, full semester there. I got married. In fact, it was Pastor John's first uh, wedding that he presided over. It was a cool deal, man. And, and my wife and I, she's now a leader in the, in the women's ministries on Tuesday nights, but it all started in prison. If someone hadn't shared Christ with me, I wouldn't have been able to, to be saved from two decades of drug addiction. Very important, in my opinion, to take that step, even though it may be uncomfortable. Uh, be aware of the Holy Spirit's nudging when you're around people. He will give you the power. He'll put the words in your mouth. I, I could never imagine my life being like this. And to be able to do that for somebody else or just be a part of that is, is just an amazing thing. We are the church. Well, come on, everybody. Would you keep your hands together and just welcome all the guys and gals and everybody online today. Welcome to church, everybody. Woohoo! Hey, we are in week number four and the conclusion of this series that we've entitled We Are the Church. We're going to jump into that in just a moment. Before we do, let me just remind you that next weekend, the foremost authority on leadership, John Maxwell, is going to be with us in our weekend services, and we are going to grow together. We're going to thrive together. Now, I need you to place special note on this fact that he is only going to be speaking live on the Saturday night 5 p.m. service because of his schedule. And so if you want to see him live, you'll need to be here Saturday night. You'll need to get here early. And then all of our services on Sunday will be video teaching. And it's going to be an amazing, incredible experience. We're going to grow together and see God do great things in our church. And then the week after that, we kick into a brand new four-week relationship series that we've entitled A Love Story. So let me just say this, whether you're single, single again, or been married for 50 years, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't because we're going to implore uh, God's principles into your life that are going to cause your relationships to absolutely flourish. There's going to be all kinds of creative elements and so I'm just challenging you even now, think about who you can bring with you to, to that series. All right. You guys ready to jump into the message today? All right, I need you all a little rowdy with me today, all right? Because this, I'm gonna take you somewhere today, all right? So we've been on this series, on this journey that we've been looking through some of the values that God is calling us to be about as a local church. And in week one, we talked about the fact that we are risk takers, we're faith-filled. In week two, we talked about that we serve, that we're not consumers, we're contributors. Last week, we talked about the fact that we believe it's more blessed to give than to receive. We're going to be generous. Today, I want to talk to you about a value that is so near and dear to my heart, and that is reaching people that are, that are far from God. And in fact, I want to do that today by actually taking you to a verse that comes out of the book of Mark chapter 2. Now, before I give you this verse, let me give you a little bit of context on all of this. So Jesus had just healed this guy, and he goes to a guy named Matthew after that, and he calls him to begin to follow him. Now, Matthew is a very sinful IRS agent, 
all right? And, and it actually shocked the religious, religious leaders of the day that, I, that Matthew decided to follow Jesus. But he didn't just follow him. He came alongside and threw the biggest party at his house and invited all kinds of questionable characters and sinners over to the house, to which all of the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day they made the statement. They said, who does Jesus think he is eating with all these thinners? Because that's how a religious person says it. They're just a bunch of thinners. Look at them thinners. Look at the thinners that are out there. To which Jesus' response would have been shockingly controversial because when he fired back at them, it was a jaw-dropping statement, and I want you to see what it is that he said. It says in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the who? The sick. And the next line would have ticked them all off. Like they would have thought this would have been heresy. He said, I've not come to call the righteous, but he came to call the sinners. And for me, when I read this verse, it's a very emotional verse to me because here's Jesus. And when you recognize that Jesus didn't come for the healthy, he came for the sick. When you realize that Jesus didn't come for those that apparently consider themselves as righteous, he came for those that are sinners, like it does something on the inside of you. I don't know if you remember the the opening video of Logan's story, but I don't know how it hits you, but when I watched it for the very first time, like it hit me so deeply, so emotionally. Because here's a guy that he finds Christ in one of our correctional facility services, and after getting out, he relapses, goes back into a drug lifestyle, and gets caught back up in this pattern. And there's a lot of people that don't know Logan, they don't know his story, they don't know him, and that from the outside, they might look at him and say, ha, looks like the church didn't do any good for him, did it? But when I see Logan, I see something completely, totally different. Because at the point that he relapsed, I see a guy that probably when he was a whole lot younger started making some really bad choices and found himself in a very bad pattern in life. And I see a guy that in the midst of the relapse, I see him still desiring God. I see a guy that is still seeking after God. He's trying. He's not quite there yet. He's pushing with everything that he's got. There's this spiritual battle that is raging on the inside of him for his soul. Like he is is reaching towards what he knows is right, but being pulled back by what he knows is wrong. And yet there comes a moment in his life after 20 years of drug addiction that by the power of the Spirit of God, there's a breakthrough in his life. He crashes through that ceiling and experiences an incredible life change in his life. In fact, I brought a picture of uh, Logan and Jessalyn on their wedding day for you because I'm just so absolutely flat out proud of them. And honestly... It makes me emotional when I see that because Logan actually reminds me a lot of me. It reminds me a lot about myself. In fact, I'm going to make a, a statement that could be controversial for some of you. I've always dreamed of pastoring a church that was filled with people just like that. The reality is, is that all of us, to some degree or another, we've, we've all come from something like that. We've all got something like that on the inside. But when the day happened that we finally recognized that Jesus didn't come for those that have their act all figured out, but instead he came for those that are sick and broken and sinners like me, when I realized that, it changes everything changes everything and maybe just maybe there are those that are listening to me today 
that you can identify a lot with Logan's story. Maybe there are a lot of similarities in your life that you've been trying to pursue God and then there's things because of old habits and old traditions and an old lifestyle that you get sucked back in. And I'm believing that today is gonna be the day that you are gonna experience incredible breakthrough in your life. In fact, I'm excited today to kind of share you, with you a little bit of my story. Because uh, growing up, I had the most amazing parents. Like they really showed what a Christ follower is supposed to look like in the home. They made sure that I was in church. The only problem was is that I kind of grew up having a relationship with my church instead of having a relationship with God. And I'm not going to blame the church for that. It's probably just because I wasn't paying attention in church. All right? The only thing I remember about church is those pews. How many remember the pews? Like those are the most uncomfortable seating that has ever been created in the history of mankind. Right? You know why? Because they are torturing devices for all the normal churchgoers. (laughs) Like all I remember at church is standing up and sitting down. Standing up and sitting down. Standing up and sitting down. And then they asked you to grab that little hymnal. You open it up to page 248, and we would always sing verses number one, two, and four. (laughs) We never sang verse three, right? Like, it never happened. We never sang, but what's up with verse number three, everybody? And I don't know, I just... There was just something about it that I just had a hard time connecting in with all of it. And so when I got into high school, I began to make a lot of really bad choices and decisions in my life. And I remember that I began to feel the weight of my sin weigh heavy on me. But just like Logan, there was something on the inside of me that was drawing me to Jesus. So I began to seek God even though I was still doing a lot of bad things. And when I finally realized that Jesus didn't come for those that have this whole thing figured out, but he came for the sick, the broken, the sinners like me, my only reasonable response to that was to go all in with God, was to give him my entire life. And I'm going to tell you, everybody, I didn't just give him half. I didn't just give him a part. I gave him Everything. I I went all in. In fact, as soon as I went all in with God, immediately I started trying to bring my friends to church so that their lives could be changed. And here's what I noticed, that when I finally went all in with God, I discovered that the church wasn't dead, but it was actually alive. It was actually powerful. So I remember I went to all my teammates and I said, hey guys, y'all need to come to church with me. And they didn't come, but I went, and it was perfect, perfect. I went going, I walked away going, man, this was the most amazing service ever. God spoke to me. This would have been perfect for them. (laughs) So the next week, I invited a bunch of my friends, other friends. I said, please come to church with me. They didn't come. I went, (gasps) it was perfect Like God was speaking to me, I just sat there with tears in my eyes, and I'm like, they would have loved this. This would have been perfect for them. So I asked them the third week, and they came. And lo and behold, it was Wacky Sunday. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? You bring a friend, and it just happens to be the one Sunday that the tambourine lady shows on up. (laughs) And man, she's just going at that thing, man. She's just, mm, 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 mm. Woo! I don't even think God likes that. Like, seriously, do you think God could like that? I know I didn't like it. I know my friends didn't like that. And then the next week, it was offering Sunday. It's like, lock the doors, and nobody's leaving until everybody gives. And I'm like, hide your kids, hide your wife, hide your husband. And, mm. And then the week after that, it was, how many of you remember? The Evangelist Sunday. And it was the evangelist that showed up with a double-breasted suit and the permed hair. And everything he said was an extra syllable. (laughs) Who talks like that? (laughs) And God. 
has something of special for your life. Do you ever go to Chick-fil-A and do that? I'd uh, like to order a chicken a sandwich. I'm like thinking, why? Why? Of all the days, why today? So I just know that when we first came to Pastor Life Fellowship, I just had a dream. I just had a dream that we could create a place that really wasn't for church people. A place where people that, just like Logan, can come, and there's not a bunch of Christianese, and a bunch of things that are confusing, but a place where they can actually come just like they are with all their questions, with all their hang-ups, with all their loose screws, with all of our, with all of our past. And you and me alike, we can find Jesus in a massive way. And that's why every single week, in every service, in every single week, in every single service, I give a call for salvation. I present the gospel because we believe around here, we have passion to reach people that are far from God. And so what I want to do today is I want to actually show you a story of four guys that powerfully were used to be able to win their friend to see their friend come to Jesus. And it says in Mark chapter 2, it says a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. And they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. And some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them, And since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, I'm going to tell you that your faith can be seen. When he saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, here's what I want you to know. Before Jesus heals this man, which he does, he focuses, first of all, on the biggest need that this man has, and he forgives him of his sins, which brings us to our first and our last we statement of this series, and that's this. We will do whatever it takes to reach our world for Christ because we believe that found people Find people. We believe it. Now, just like in previous weeks, I want to ask you to rate yourself as to how you do in this area on a scale of one being the lowest, apathetic, and 10 being the highest, which is very passionate. Now, don't select 10 in your mind unless you're Billy Graham. (laughs) All right? So let me first of all speak to those that may be very passionate about doing this. You probably would rate yourself somewhere between a six, seven, eight, maybe even a nine. And let me tell you what's true about you. In your life, you've probably led multiple people to Christ. Let me tell you what's true about you. In the last seven days, you were probably praying for people that are far from God, maybe that you even love, that they would come to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Let me tell you about you. Most likely, you have somebody with you today that is far from God. They're seated next to you. You probably had somebody with you last week. You're probably already thinking about who you're going to bring to hear John Maxwell next week. You're already thinking about who can I bring to the relationship series here coming up in February. Like, you deeply care for people that are far from God. Now, those that may be on the other side of the spectrum, maybe you're a little bit more apathetic. Let me just say this. Some of you, that may be in that area. For some of you, you've never led somebody to Christ. Maybe it is true of you that even in the last seven days, you've not been praying for anybody to come know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. 
Maybe for some of you, it's been a long time since you've actually brought somebody with you to service. In fact, for some of you, you've never done that before. And I'm, listen, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I just want us to call it like it is. Let's be honest. Let's be honest about the fact that do our beliefs actually line up with, the, with our actions? Are we living out our beliefs in our lives? And so I want you to rate yourself on a scale of one to 10, where are you? And I'll say this to you as your pastor, that if you are a five or below, I truly believe that that is unacceptable as a Christ follower because God has called us to reach people that are far from him because found people, we find people. And so what I wanna do is I wanna spend the rest of our time today And I want to give you two incredible principles that are going to help all of us as a church united in the correctional facilities, those of you that are watching online, those of you that are here, so that all of us can fulfill the mandate that is on our life so that we can begin to love people into a relationship with Jesus. And the very first thing I want to give you is this, that you and I, we're going to need to bear some burdens. We're going to have to care for some people that are in need. In fact, I want you to see this play out in these four men's lives. It says in Mark that these, some men came bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Now notice this, it doesn't say that they said to their friend, hey dude, check it out, Jesus is gonna be in town for a big concert. You ought to get your tickets, get an Uber, make sure you're there. No, no, they came up to him. They said, man, we're going to walk with you. We're going to journey. Well, they can't walk with him, but we're going to journey with you. We're going to carry you. We're we're, going to, even if we have to carry you five miles, we're going to do whatever it takes to get you to Jesus. We're going to get you to Jesus. See, one of the biggest weaknesses that I see right now in people sharing their faith is How many of you guys know what a drive-by shooting is? Huh? Drive-by shooting. That's where people pull up in a car, lower the window, and they just just unload. It's a tragedy. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that do what I call drive-by witnessing. So in other words, um, you're not involved in that person's life. You just kind of drive by. Maybe you roll down your window and you shout out, hey, dude, Jesus loves you, man. Come to my church. Like you just, you drive, and that's the nice people. The rude ones are like, you're going to hell (laughs) where the worm never dies. Turn or burn, baby. And Jesus loves you, you know? (laughs) And we just kind of do this drive by. Hey, everyone, look at my eyes. Listen to this. That doesn't work in today's culture. That doesn't work. A for effort, D for effectiveness. It doesn't work. I mean, I'm glad for your passion. I'm glad that you're trying to do something. That doesn't work. Here's what does work and what you need to know is that people need to know that you care about them, not that you're trying to convert them to something. And I know what people think. They're like, well, I don't no, how to share my faith. Well, I love what Theodore Roosevelt said. He said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. All they want to know is do you care about me? So when I'm hurting, will you hurt with me? When I'm crying, will you cry with me? Like, When they have a baby, go to the baby shower. When when their mom dies, don't just send them a text and another text and I'm I'm so sorry that your mom died. No, 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 show up at the funeral. Like love goes the extra mile. We've got to go the extra mile. We're gonna, when we find people that are in need, we're gonna bear some burdens. In fact, I put it down like this. We have to show them his love before we tell them about his love. In fact, let me tell you a cool story today 
about Kayla. Kayla is a young lady in our church. In fact, I brought a picture with me today of her. Every single Sunday morning, she'll stop by a local restaurant here in Allen for breakfast. And after doing this for a little bit of time, she began to develop a friendship with the general manager. And one week, she was talking to him, and he began to talk about all kinds of problems in his wife's pregnancy, to which Kayla stopped the whole thing, and she said, do you mind if I pray for you? And right there in the middle of this restaurant here in Allen, the man said, okay. And Kayla began to pray over his marriage, over his, his wife's pregnancy, over his other children, over his life. And in the middle of this restaurant, this general manager begins to burst out in full-on tears and then starts opening up, talking about how there's massive physical complications with his wife's pregnancy. And that not only is his wife going through all kinds of problems physically, but that she was just let go from her job. And to make, to make ends meet, she actually had to go out eight months pregnant and begin to clean homes. And life has begun to fall apart for the two of them. And so Kayla just sat there and she listened. And then when he finished, she looked back at him and began to speak God's word of truth into his life. And, and a massive, incredible thing began to happen on the inside of him. In fact, it was this past Christmas that Kayla thought, you know what? I want to do something. I want to I blow them away this Christmas. I'm going to bless the fire out of them. And so her and her family actually showed up at this general manager's house at Christmas and provided for them the best Christmas that their kids and him and his wife have ever experienced. They were absolutely, completely blown away that there would be a girl like Kayla that would care. That she would come alongside and that she would bear their burdens. And I'm going to tell you, this, this family... They're not Christ followers yet, but here's what I can promise you. Kayla is going to love them into a relationship with Jesus. You mark my words. You watch what happens. Everybody, we don't just tell people about God's love. We first have to show them God's people love, God's, God, God's love. Listen, I don't know how it's going to play out for you, but here's what I can guarantee. If you'll begin to pray, oh God, open my eyes to the people that are all around me. You're gonna to begin to see people that are in need and you're gonna be able to help them. You're gonna to begin to see people that are hurting and you're gonna be able to heal them. You're gonna to begin to see people that need someone to listen to them and you're gonna be that person. You're gonna see that person at work that you absolutely hate. You can't stand being around them. But God's gonna to begin to touch your heart and what's going to happen is this, that your heart is actually going to become softened to them because you're going to find out what they're going through in their personal life is absolute hell. And God's going to use you to get involved in their life. You're going to bear some burdens, and you're going to love them into a relationship with Jesus. God has called us to bear one another's burdens. And what I love about these four guys is that they didn't just say that we, we want to get our friend to Jesus. No, no, no. They said we have to get people to Jesus. We've got to do it. It's not just a, hey, I want to. It's a, I have to. Here's the second principle that I'm going to give you today. <laughs> and some of y'all are going to really like this one. Because God's calling us, number two, to break some rules. So some of you are about to actually get excited about this message at this point, okay? Because you love breaking the rules. I'm gonna tell you, I love breaking the rules. I don't like rules. I'm gonna be honest with you, growing up, I broke the rules all the time. I never waited 30 minutes after eating to go take a swim. I broke the rules. When I was growing up, I never used a seatbelt in the front seat of the car because my mom was my seatbelt. If we ever had to stop, there was an unmovable arm that came flying across. I broke the rules. I've run with scissors in my hands. I broke the rules. 
I've run with a lollipop in my mouth. I broke the rules. I have sniffed more magic markers than you can ever even imagine. I've broke the rules. And what I love about these guys is that they massively broke the rules so that they could get their friend to Jesus. In fact, here's what they did. Check it out. It says, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, here's what they did. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Now, don't miss this. We've got to get our friend to Jesus. We have to. But the place is packed. We can't get in. Jesus is teaching. So what did they do? They went up on top of the roof and they began to dig through. They began to dig through. Now, I actually went and did a little research to find out how they used to make the roofs of these homes. Come to find out, one of the commentaries said that they would put these beams that were about three feet apart, and then they would fill it in with all kinds of mud, manure, and fat. Now, the manure was primarily there so as to fertilize this grass that they would like to have growing on the top of their roof because people would take naps on their roofs at the cool of the day. So notice this. The guys began to dig through the roof. Question for you. What is one of the things that was made up of the roof? Come on, everybody. Sometimes to get your friends to Jesus... You're going to have to dig through a little, mm mm-hmm. I'm going to say it to this side. Listen. (laughs) I'm just telling you, sometimes to get your friends to Jesus, you're going to have to dig through a little bit of, uh uh-hmm. Hashtag, did he just say that in church? Oh, yes, I did. You're going to have to dig through some of that. So here these guys are up on the top of the roof. They start peeling back the roof. And can you just imagine being the owner of the house? Jesus is teach, teaching, and all of a sudden something hits you on the head. And then another thing, you finally look up. There's like a little shaft of light that starts coming in. You see these fingers start moving things all to the side. You're probably thinking, you know, <laughs> insurance is not going to cover this, you know. And the guy finally looks up, and there are four guys that didn't just want to get their friend to Jesus. They had to get their friend to Jesus. And I don't, I don't even know how they lowered him down. I don't know how that all played out for, for them. You know, I don't think they brought pulleys and all this stuff. I just think, I, I think they got there, and it just it wasn't what they thought, so they just improvised, and so they're up there on the thing, and Bill, you take that leg, and Ted, you take that leg, and Bert, you got that arm. Let's just kind of lower him down. Looks about six feet left. That should be about good. We're going to drop him on the count of three. Because I don't think he's going to get re-paralyzed again, you know, so one, two, three, Boom. And I absolutely love that here were four guys that didn't see obstacles. They didn't view obstacles from the standpoint that they were thinking that God was trying to stop them. No, these were guys that said, we've got to break some rules. We've got to do whatever we can do to get people to Christ. We've got to get them to Jesus. And I love, I am thrilled that we have a church that is packed with crazy people that are just like that, that are saying, I want to do everything I can do to to win people to Christ. In fact, let me introduce to you, let me introduce to you Thomas. In fact, Thomas is a small business owner here in the area. He owns a moving company. And Thomas has made the commitment that some of the main people that he'll hire to work for him are convicted felons because They can't get a job anywhere else. And he told me, he said, I just feel like this is exactly something that Jesus would do. 
And he doesn't just employ them. He actually has kind of put some rules in place. And he said, listen, if I'm employing you enough, I'm, I'm giving you this opportunity. I'm also going to require that you're going to be in church with me. And the guys resisted at first. But now many of the weeks you'll see when Thomas comes into service, there'll be other guys that are there that are getting a second chance at life. They're getting a job. And they're having an opportunity to hear the word of God being poured into their lives. And God is revolutionizing them. He is changing them. I love a guy named Thomas that will do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. In fact, let me introduce you to Greg. Greg is a small business owner in the community. And he has kind of a pool company. And he actually came to us and asked, he said, can I have the permission at my cost to be able to care and maintain our, our, our outdoor water baptismal. And so it was on New Year's Eve day that one of his guys, Carlos, was out cleaning our outdoor water baptismal. And Greg just happened to swing by to check up on him. And when he did, Carlos asked him the question, said, hey, Mr. Greg, what, what is this thing that I'm cleaning? I've never seen this before. He said, it's called a baptismal. Carlos said, what's a baptismal? So Greg began to share his faith with one of his employees. And on New Year's Eve day, in the backyard of this church, a young man named Carlos, in front of a baptismal, in front of a cross, committed his heart and life to Jesus. In fact, I brought a picture with me today of Carlos. And Carlos is moving forward in the things of God. We're going to see him get baptized this year. Let me tell you something. Here's the key. To reach people for Christ, we're going to have to do some things that normal churches don't do. We're going to have to do it all the time. One of those is church online. Uh, I'll be honest with you, in the church world among pastors, it's probably one of the highest debated topics on the effectiveness of it and does it really impact people and the ecclesiology of it and blah, 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 blah. And while they keep all debating and arguing about it, we keep reaching hundreds of thousands of people every year pointing them to Jesus. We believe in reaching the digital space and redeeming that for the cause of Christ. In fact, I'll just say this, as we are walking into this new year, God is ramping up the impact that is going to be made in the digital realm, in this community all around as we move forward in the things of God. And we just started thinking, how can we capitalize on this? How can we do more than we've ever done before? And so we've actually, we're planning on purchasing AdWords on Google. So when somebody types in church online... There's going to be a little thing that pops up, a little ad that says, are you searching for church online? Here, try church online. Here's the problem with that. How many of you all know nobody is searching for church online? <laughs> so we ask the question, well, what are people searching for? And so we decided we're going to put some ad words to naked ladies. <laughs> naked ladies. Trust me, don't Google it. Don't do that. Just take my word on it. Don't do it. But when somebody Googles naked ladies, and don't Google it, okay? But if somebody Googles naked ladies, there's going to be a little ad that pops up and says, are you looking for naked ladies? Why don't you try church online? <laughs> Come on, somebody. Come on, everybody. We've got to think different. And we're going to do this in the same area when it comes to people considering divorce and depression and grief and suicide and addictions. We're going to reclaim the space for Christ. Everybody, look in my eyes and hear this. The church used to be the most innovative and creative place on the planet. Do you know that the church used to be the center of the cities? It used to be the epicenter of the cities. Out of the church flowed all of the arts. But today, the church has delegated innovation to Apple. We've delegated creativity to Hollywood. We've delegated relationships to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and beyond. 
We've actually delegated taking care of the poor to the government. And I'm going to tell you, everybody, the government doesn't even know how to take care of the poor because they were never called to take care of the poor. The church was called to take care of the, of the poor. Amen, everybody. <laughs> Listen to me. We have to stop going to church and we have to start being the church. Like, I have a vision for our church that I've still not seen happen. I see a church that doesn't reject people who are not followers of Christ, but instead, I see a church that we help love people into a relationship with Christ. I see a church that acknowledges that we're not doing it unless we're doing it. Like we can talk about reaching the lost all we want, but unless we're doing it, we're not doing it. We have a dedication that we're gonna do whatever it takes to reach people that are far from Christ. We are addicted to life change around here. I see a church that understands that Jesus didn't come for those that have their act all figured out, but instead he came for people that are just like us. Broken, sick, sinners and that when God changes our life we'll do whatever it takes we're going to bear people's burdens we're going to get involved in their life and it'll get messy sometimes we're going to have to dig through some religious mm -hmm, to get them to Jesus we're going to break some rules we're going to do things that normal churches don't do so that we can Help bring people into a real relationship with Jesus. Who are we? We're the church. And we will do whatever it takes to reach our world for Christ because we believe that found people find people. Amen, everybody? Amen. So come on, why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes? God speaking to you today through this service. You know, it's my prayer that no matter where you're at on that scale, that you would take a step forward. Take a step. Lost people matter to God. He gave his everything. I've heard it said that no man should be able to hear the gospel twice somebody hasn't even heard it once. God is raising up an army around this place. As we get ready to walk into February with John Maxwell coming and relationship series, I'm praying that God is going to begin to inspire you and give you courage and boldness to begin to reach your family and friends so that they can come and hear the life-changing truth of God's word. He's going to use you in the offices and with your family. So if you want God to give you a greater heart, just whisper that underneath your breath right now. Just say, Jesus, give me a heart for lost people. And I acknowledge, God, that unless I'm doing it, I'm not doing it. In Jesus' mighty name. Here's what I can tell you as you pray that prayer. When you finally see that person submit to Christ, it'll be the greatest day of your life. It may be in your own home that they do it. It might be in a service, but you're going to watch these tears come down their face as they finally surrender their life, their eternity to Jesus. And you're going to actually become addicted to change lives. So God, do that in all of us, I pray. And if you're here today and you're listening, maybe in the correctional facilities, in person, online, and you are away from Jesus, you need to know that right now you're the most important person. You're not a number. You are, you are one that God gave up everything to reach. You're valuable. You are not your past. You are not what you did. You are who Christ says that you are. And he's calling you into a relationship with him, and it's time for you to surrender your life to him. So right where you're at, won't you pray this prayer with me and just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender it all. I 
confess that I'm a sinner. And I'm asking you to forgive me. And I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer today. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we just put our hands together and celebrate all kinds of folks that have gone from death to life. God bless you, everybody. Yeah, decisions were made all over the place for Christ. In this room, watching online, if that's you, would you please check out this QR code, scan it. We want to walk with you on your next steps. You don't have to do this alone. You're not intended to do this alone. Our responsibility is to come alongside of you. We're going to provide resources. We want to walk this out with you. So if you made that decision, whether it live in purpose, person here in the auditorium today or online, scan that QR code. We'd love to come alongside of you. Also, just a couple of announcements. Many of you probably already know, but Candace Cameron is going to do a live podcast event here at Life Fellowship on February the 16th. Tickets are going fast. If you want to get tickets, you need to scan that QR code and to grab your tickets. Uh, thank you for being such a generous church. You guys are incredible. The only way we can do what we have the opportunity to do is because of your generosity. The ways to give will be on the screen. Uh, again, you, whether you do it online, drop offerings in the box, however you do that, thank you so much. Hey, we're finishing up the series. We are the church. I don't know about you, but I've been challenged throughout this series. Am I the church? God, am I doing what you're asking me to do? Am I using the gifts and talents that you've blessed me with to accomplish the things that you want me to accomplish? I pray that each of you also have been challenged. And let's spend a little bit of time over this next week, even as you leave here today, and ask God, God, what do you say? How do I need to do this differently? Are there things, are there any course corrections I need to make? Let's be intentional about that over this next week. So let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Let's, write, let's stand up, please. Lord, again, we love you. I thank you for this, this service. Thank you for this series. Lord, it's challenged me. I pray that it's challenged all of us, whether you're in the room or watching online. We are the church. Lord, are we the church? Help us to be about what you want us to be about, doing the things that you want us to, to do. Lord, you've gifted each of us with our own unique talents and abilities. Help us to use those for you, to build your kingdom. Lord, your word says, if you be lifted up, you'll draw all men unto you. That's our heart's desire, Lord. We want to see lives change because of what you're doing in us and through us. Lord, I ask that you bless each person, each family represented here in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We love you. Thank you for being here. Our prayer teams are at the front. We'd love to pray with you. You are dismissed.